Good morning. Good morning. It's a rather brisk morning, not compared to yesterday. Uh, did anybody see lower than minus 26? We had minus 26 in our truck. What did you guys have? 28. Minus 28. I'm glad we were at our house and not yours. <laughs> Um, if you have your Bibles, go ahead and open to the second chapter of the book of Ephesians. So is everybody ready for Christmas morn? Amen. All the presents bought, stuffed under the tree, stockings hung by the chimney, or in our case, the television. Everybody ready? No. Are we ever ready? You know, because I, I think about this. You know, when Jesus came into the world 2,000 years ago, the world was not ready for him. Now, I, I can understand some parts of the world that hadn't received the message, they hadn't received the prophecies, they hadn't received those, those signs that would predict his coming, but there were other parts of the world that had those signs. And, and yet, it took an angelic host to announce, to proclaim his coming, his birth. And it took wise men coming from the east to make the civil authorities aware that something significant was happening. And yet, Scripture tells us that the time was right. It says that God waited until the time was right. And then this baby was born. And, and you know, we, we celebrate Christmas because the church found early on that people were so deifying Jesus that they had forgot His humanity. And there were even false teachings going around that he wasn't really a physical person like you and I. He was something different. Well, he was something different because at one and the same time, he was every bit as physical and you as you and I, but he was also carried within him the nature, <coughs> the very nature of God. And so the church said we need to bring the focus back so that people understand that he was a man just like you and I. And so they brought about the celebration of his birth. Now, the, they chose uh, the day that we have, and actually there's a couple of variances throughout the, the, the history of Christmas, and some say it was a little bit earlier, some say it was a little bit later. They didn't choose it based on when he was born. They chose it at a time that the world had come in and Satan had come in and taken a day and was using it to celebrate his own garbage. And they said, no. All things belong to God. All days belong to God. You're not getting this one. We're taking it back. And so they chose December 25th. Okay? Now, a lot of people say, oh, it, you know, that was a pagan holiday. What day does not belong to God? What day do the pagans have a right to? They're all His. He doesn't just dispense, oh, some for the pagans, some for the, 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 the Satanists, and some for the Buddhists, and, and so on and so forth. They all belong to God. And so Paul writes to us and he tells us that every day, regardless of what you're celebrating, you should celebrate unto God. So I have no problem celebrating Christmas on December 25th. And I would encourage you, don't have any problem celebrating on December 25th. Um, but I'm going to do... I'm reading out of Ephesians today. And this is not your typical Christmas message. Um, next week, we are going to have a shortened service. We're going to read the Christmas story. Uh, we're going to do a few songs to kind of to help us set our focus. Because in the joy of, of opening the presents and the excitement, a lot of times it's very easy for us to lose our focus. So we're going to focus next week on what Christmas is really about. But today I want to move a little bit further ahead than just Christmas. So if you have your Bibles, open to Ephesians chapter 2. I'm going to start in verse 1. <clears throat> so Paul is 
writing to the church in Ephesus, and he says, And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work, and the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. But God. <clears throat> so what, what, what Paul has done right here is he has set up for us the stage. Because if you are a believer today, you were once like this. If you are not a believer today, you are like this. Okay? So what, what Paul is doing is he's establishing a condition, and then he says, but God. And I love those two words, because in any situation, I was reading earlier this week, again, I, I love Psalm 107, um, and it talks about just the conditions of life that people find them in, sometimes simply because they were in the wrong place at the wrong time, sometimes because they chose foolishly, sometimes because they just outright sinned. And yet in each case, when they got caught up and they were caught in the trap and, and things looked grim, they called out to God and God saved them. God made a way for them in the wilderness. He rescued them from the perils of the sea. God delivered them from the bondage that they were in. I love the fact, but God. And as a Christian, that is our saving grace right there. But God. Because here's what comes next. But God being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us even when we were dead in our trespasses made us alive together with Christ by grace you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God, not a result of work, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God has prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Okay, so first, in order to understand salvation, you have to understand sin. Okay? Because the nature of man at the moment that we are created is, is sin. We are, we are caught up in sin. We are stuck. And in order to understand salvation and to really appreciate the incredible richness of salvation, you first have to understand the, the, the despair of sin. The, the full measure of sin. And so... What, what Paul does is he lays out for us, he says, hey, look, you know, in, in the end of chapter 1, he's talking about those in the world, and then in chapter 2, he reminds us, you were just like them. All of us were. We were caught out there too. But God. But God. And he says, God being rich in mercy. Now, yeah, now what is mercy? Does anybody know what mercy is? I got a pretty good definition for you. Mercy is not getting what you deserved. Okay? Mercy is you deserve death, you deserve punishment, but God is not going to give that to you. You don't get what you deserve. It's the flip side of the coin from grace, which is getting something you didn't deserve. So we see in uh, 2 Corinthians, when, when Paul is writing, he says, you know, Jesus became sin, our sin. He took our sin upon himself, and he bore that punishment for us. So we, even though we were deserving of death, God in his mercy did not give us death. Instead, he gives to us righteousness, and that's his grace. That he gives us righteousness. But, but he doesn't stop there. He says, but God being rich in mercy, because God doesn't want to pay out what man is duly owed. God desires that we would have a better eternity. 
Because of the great love with which He loved us. The great love with which He loved us. Now, 1 John talks about God being in His very nature love. As a matter of fact, we come to understand what love is because God loved us. This is His nature. This is who He is. This is uh, just intrinsic to what makes up God. Love. And He desired, because of this love, to extend mercy. Now let's talk about this love for just a minute. Because one of the things, you know, we, we get caught up in, Oh, God is love, peace and love, flowers and VW Beetles. <laughs> I don't miss those days at all. I remember my mom dressing me in bell bottoms. There are pictures to prove it somewhere, I'm sure. And, and I remember felt shirts with leather ties. Oh. But God. <laughs> Love does not mean giving you your way. Love means wanting the absolute best for you. The absolute best for you. And sometimes love is saying no. Love is saying, I, I've got something better for you than this. And so when we have this understanding, this, this misapprehension, that because God is love, we get everything we want. And, and if it's in opposition to us, and obviously it's not God, it's the devil, and we start praying against the devil for something that God, in His wisdom and in His infinite love for us, is preventing because He has something better for us. Okay, so we, we need to understand the nature of this love that God has. God is perfect in every aspect of His being. And His love is perfect. And, it, and we know that it's perfect because of the cross. Okay, because His love, His great love, drove Him to such extreme measures. It, one of the things they say when you can want to take the measure of someone's love is how do they express it? What, what have they done to express their love? Okay. Now, how many of you would like uh, your spouse or the great love of your life to tell you the first thing in the morning, I love you. I like that. I like that. But then, how would you like if the rest of the day, everything they did gave lie to the, the first statement of their day? No, you don't. That's, that's not love. It doesn't matter that you said the words. If your actions... Do not back up and carry through with your words. The words have no value. God gave value to His words. Right there. Right there. And the fact that there is a way is astounding. It's absolutely amazing that God would choose despite Him being the offended party, despite Him being the one that, that was given offense, He is the one that chose to bridge the gap back to us. This great love. Everybody should have John 3.16 memorized. If you don't, spend some time in the Word. Remember uh, John 3.16 and 17. Turn with me there if you would right now. We're going to take a look at this because I want to show you some aspects of God and the first thing we need to look at is His love. So go ahead and turn over to John 3. So, Jesus is meeting with the Pharisee. He's, he's having a conversation. Now, this Pharisee is really seeking truth. And... Jesus is giving him truth, and, and it's a little bit hard for him to grasp because he's had these, these, these concrete ideas so fixed firmly in his head that what Jesus is saying is really shaking the foundation of what he thinks he believes. <clears throat> so I'm going to back up. Let's, uh, I'm actually going to back up quite a ways. We're going to start up in, in verse 1. Okay, because you've got to get the context to understand why Jesus said what He said. 
So verse 1, chapter 3 says, Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs unless uh, no, these signs that you do unless God is with him. Now it's interesting because Nicodemus is coming <coughs> at night, and and we find out later that he came at night because he was afraid of of the Pharisees. He's, he's afraid of his own party. He's afraid of his brothers, and 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 he says, um, Rabbi, and he calls him teacher. Which is very, uh, I mean, that's that's very honoring that here is a ruler of the people and he's calling Jesus teacher. And then he says, we know. See, Nicodemus already knows that, that Jesus is sent of God. And yet, he's, he's weighing these things and he's afraid of his own people. He's afraid of the Pharisees and yet he knows that Jesus is sent of God. And so he's coming in the night. He's, I got to know more. I pray that every one of you had a dark night at some point in your life. And I, I don't mean physically that, that period where the, the sun has gone from the sky. I'm talking about that period where in the confrontation of your own soul and your own sin and your eyes were revealed that, that there is got to be more than what I have. And for some of you, that dark night is going to look radically different than it does to others of you. But I pray every one of you had a dark night because without that dark night, you cannot have the dawn that comes with salvation. Because see, you've got to come to God in complete, total, utter dependence on Him. Having no, bringing nothing to the cross. You have nothing of worth and value. And if you come to God thinking that you've got something to offer and, and you're willing to make a trade, hey God, I'll give you this if you give me eternity, then, then you're not coming in desperation. You're not coming understanding that it is completely and totally by His grace that you are saved. You're thinking that there's some kind of horse trading going on here. And so Nicodemus is in the midst of his dark night. Now we know later that he made a stand because we know that after Jesus was crucified he was one of the two men that went to address the body of Jesus, to dress it and, and prepare it for burial. So we know that at some point he made a stand. He says, uh, we know you're from God because you, nobody can do these things unless God is with him. And Jesus answered, verse 3, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit... He cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of flesh is flesh, and that which is born of spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I have said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the spirit. Now, poor Nicodemus, he's, he's got to be, okay, he's, he's very stuck in the, the material things, the way the physical world works, and Jesus just tells him, you've got to be born again. I think, what you're talking about, Willis? <laughs> and Jesus lays an incredibly deep spiritual truth at Nicodemus' feet. Nicodemus says to him, verse 9, How can these things be? And I think Jesus at this moment is, is, is not... I don't think Jesus is angry at this moment. I, I, I think Jesus is kind of hurt at this moment. He says, Jesus answered him, Are you the teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand these things? Truly, truly, I say to you, we speak of what we know and bear witness to what we have seen, but you do not receive our testimony. If I have told you earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you of heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except he who has descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. I'm going to pause here for just a second. Because Nicodemus is a ruler. He's a, a religious, he's one of the ruling party in Israel. And, and as a religious leader, he should be a teacher. 
He's the one that the people look to for answers. And Jesus, I think, he's kind of marveling a little bit, going, how could you not know this? How can you not understand? And, and then in verse 14, he even prophesies his own death and says that as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. Why? Verse 15, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. Okay? Now this is, this is the condition, this is what's happening, but here's the why. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe in him is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment. The light has come into the world, and the people love the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. So you have to understand why Jesus said these, these two miraculous verses because Nicodemus didn't understand and he should have. He had the very words of God. He had the law and the prophets all speaking of this divine moment in time. This miraculous place in history. And he didn't understand what was going on and yet he's supposed to be one of the learned. One of the men that were educated to be looking for this very event. And Jesus, looking in the, the conversation, in the midst of that conversation, He says that whoever believes in Him would have eternal life. Why? Because God so loved. Because His heart was so grieved by the condition of man and the eternity that waited for man that in His love, He stepped out of what should be the just and, and moved and operated in mercy. Because absolutely God is 100% just. And if you don't come to Him with your price paid, you have to pay the price. And if you don't have a mediator that will stand between you and God and say, no, I have paid the full price for this one. This one is redeemed. The redemption price has been paid. Yeah. If you don't stand before God in that place, then you stand before Him naked and ashamed and He says, depart from Me because I never knew you. I don't care how many gold stars you got for church attendance. I don't care how many hungry people that you fed in My name. It doesn't say that you do the good works unto salvation. It says the good works are birthed out of salvation. Salvation has to come first. Come first. And it's because of His great love that we even have the opportunity for salvation. He goes on to say that He didn't come. Jesus did not come to condemn the world. Jesus didn't come here to point the finger. He came to open His arms. I remember that, that little plaque. And there's a bumper sticker too and, and it said, I asked Jesus how much He loved me. And He said this much. And he spread out his arms and died. I love that because that's sh that showing, that's expressing the full measure of God's love. Greater love has no man but that he would lay down his life for his friends. Jesus did even just for his friends. He went so far as to do it for his enemies. Because scripture says, while we were yet his enemies, Christ died for us. So Jesus took love to the nth degree. But he didn't come to condemn the world. He didn't come to point the finger because the world was already condemned. The world already stood before God with nothing to defend themselves. And so Jesus has come. Flip with me, if you would, to 1 John. We're going to go to 1 John chapter 4.
I'm going to pick up in verse 7, and we're going to read down for a little bit. Um, John, uh, of all the apostles, we, we call John the beloved disciple. And, and I don't think that God loved him necessarily more than any of the other apostles. I think John appreciated it more. He was able to receive it more easily than some of the others. I think some of them, I think, you know, uh, Peter may have got caught up in, in the position. But I think John, who was comfortable enough that at the Passover he reclined against Jesus. He understood the, the love that Christ had for people. And, and so he was beloved. I think he was not favored necessarily above any of the others. Um, I, I think he just more fully appreciated who and what Jesus was. Uh, so I, I find it amazing that John is able to express to us that which he, by his nature, felt and understood. So verse 7, 1 John chapter 4, verse 7. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. It's interesting because the <coughs> directive is that we would love one another, and yet, there's a caution there because it's, it's telling us that um, if you have been born of God, you know God, and God's love should feed through you. You are a, a conduit through which God can pour His love out into the world. But look at verse 8. Anyone who does not love does not know God because God is love. Okay? So when people come to Christ, the first thing that should begin to melt is that hardness of heart, that, that, that uh, hostility toward other people, that should begin to melt. Now some people it's going to take longer than others because some people have more, more garbage that has to be cleaned out and sorted through and gotten rid of. Some people are going to move into this aspect of the relationship with God very easily. Others it's going to take some time. But it has to happen. If it doesn't happen, then you have not yet been born of God. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us that God sent His only Son into the world so that we might live through Him. Again, there's that demonstration of God's love that is so great that He sent His Son. Um, Thursday, our eighth grandchild was born, Donovan and Carrie, uh, had their first. Uh, his name is Garrett Ralph. Nine pounds, three ounces, 21 inches long. He looks like he's already half grown. And, and uh, I dare say, if you were to ask Donovan to give up his son for somebody else, uh, he would say no. As I stood and watched the love that my son had for his son and holding him in his arm and just marveling at this thing that God had placed in his care. And you could just see the love emanating out from the Father to the Son. And yet, that is such a pale imitation for the love that God is and has. And yet, He chose to send His very Son on our behalf, His only Son for us. So it says, uh, verse 10, In this is love, not that we have loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins the payment, the price. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God abides in us, and His love is perfected in us. Okay? So again, He's giving us the, the directive. We need to be loving each other. And He gives us the, the reason, the condition for this, is because God is love, and His love should be birthed in us because we have been born again into Him, He abides in us, therefore His love should be abiding in us as well. Verse 13, By this we know that we abide in Him and He in us, because He has given us His Spirit. And we have seen and testified that the Father has sent His Son to be the Savior of the world. <coughs> Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in Him and He in God. So we have come to know and to believe the love that God has for us. God is love, and whoever abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. By this is love perfected with us, so that we may have confidence for the day of judgment, because as he is, so also are we in this world. There is no fear in love, 
But perfect love casts out fear, for fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not been perfected in love. We love because He first loved us. Now, the, the one thing that I really want to show you is that when, when you come to, to, to true saving faith, when, when you come to that place where you come to God and you offer all that you have, which is your broken life, and you understand that you have nothing of redeeming value, that, that you can come to Him and say, hey, you know, I, I got this Indian nickel, I'll, I'll trade you my eternal soul for that. You have nothing to offer Him. <coughs> if you accept the, with, with the grace freely given, the love that God has for you and the redemption and the salvation, <coughs> that He desires that you would have. See, this is one of the things that is birthed out of that. And this is one of the things that the devil works so very hard to strip away from us. It says, um, By this is love perfected with us, this is verse 17, so that we may have confidence for the day of judgment. Confidence for the day of judgment. If, if you are looking to that time when you stand before God with fear, you haven't understood the love that God has for you. Okay? You, you have not yet understood and fully grasped the nature of what salvation is. Because as He is, He being Christ, as He is absolutely perfect, absolutely righteous, so also are we in this world. And then verse 18, this should be one of those verses that you... You knit deep into your soul. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. Why? For fear has to do with punishment. Fear has to do with punishment. See, what John is looking at right here is he's saying, hey, look, if, if you're looking forward to that day when you stand before God and there's nothing but excitement, if you have fear, if you have concern, then you have not yet experienced the full love that God has for you. Let that fear fall aside and be replaced by His love. Okay? That's one of those things that we accept in faith. Sometimes we don't see it. Sometimes we don't feel it. But we know it to be true because He said it's true. And when God says something is true, it doesn't matter what it looks like out there. I think of Hezekiah standing on the wall of Jerusalem and looking out and the armies encamped about him. And the prophet tells him, hey, don't worry about it. Those that are for us are greater than those that are against us. And I'm sorry, I think it was actually the prophet's servant. And, and, the, and the servant says, what are you talking about? Look at this. There's, there's thousands and thousands of people out there. They're encamped for miles around us. And, and the servant's eyes are open and he gets to see the army of the Lord so greatly outnumbering the enemy. I think by faith we need to have our eyes open to the love that God has for us. That, that, that life-changing love that makes it so that when we come before Him, we don't come before Him with shame anymore because that's been washed away. When we go down into the water and we're resurrected anew, that's a symbol that we went down into the grave. The, the old man is dead and buried and gone and we're resurrected into a new creation. And that new creation doesn't know fear. It knows only of God's love. And when the devil comes in, and man, this makes me so angry sometimes. I've been a victim of it. I'm guaranteeing that you have to. The enemy's coming in and it's, oh, God doesn't love you. Or God doesn't love you enough. Or he's never going to forgive that sin. And he wants you to be bound up and he wants you to be caught up. And he wants you to be afraid of the God who loved you enough to send his son into the world to redeem you. Now, what's the logic of that? That God loves us so much that He made a way for us to come before Him that we could be accounted righteous and yet we're afraid to stand before Him. I look at my grandchildren and, and the, the complete and absolute trust that they have in their parents and I think, wouldn't it be great if we had that same trust to our Heavenly Father? Uh, I've told the story of taking my two older boys to the swimming pool when they were very young. And we, we don't do a lot of water in our family. Christy doesn't like the water. So we, we don't usually, we don't go to the lake very often. Um, but I, I grew up in a family where, you know, we went out in the middle of the lake and jumped off the boat and swam around and, 
uh, you know, who knows how deep it was. <coughs> you didn't come up, you weren't getting found. And, and back then, they didn't give you life jackets, they gave you a life belt. Life belts don't care which way is up. <laughs> so when you jump in the water head down, you're going to come back up with your feet sticking out of the water. Okay? And, and so I grew up in a family that was uh, very much into water. I was on the diving team, uh, swam a lot. And, and so we went to the pool, and, and the boys would stand on the side of the, the pool, and, and Christopher was very, very cautious. And he would come and, and he'd get up to the edge and he'd build up his courage. You could see him working up to it. He working up to it. No, maybe not. No, I'm going to work. And then he'd jump. Not Donovan. Donovan would start as soon as he got out of the pool running. It didn't matter if Dad was there. He knew I was going to get him sooner or later. It didn't matter if Dad was still trying to catch Christopher. And Donovan went into the water beside him. He was going. I wish we had that kind of faith. Where you know implicitly, you know deep in your bones that God is going to catch you. That, man, God, I'm, I'm taking this step in faith because you have asked me to. I'm taking this step not knowing what's there, but as you put your foot down, God puts his hand underneath you and you step on firm and solid ground. And then you take that next step and you say, God, I... I you met me the last time, I believe you're going to meet me this time. And then you get to the point where you're not looking anymore, you're just walking. Why am I saying all of this? What does this have to do with Christmas? See, all of this was bought with a price. All of this came at a great price. Punishment was required by the law. The shedding of blood was required. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. There's no taking away of sin. So, blood had to be shed. We didn't have enough blood in our bodies to pay the full blood price for our sin. So God sent a perfect sacrifice. And that perfect sacrifice that He sent came in a stable and it was born a baby boy and he was wrapped in swaddling clothes and he was laid in a manger and this beautiful new light the joy that mom and dad had that this this hey everybody's healthy everybody's well the baby is beautiful this beautiful baby was bringing with it the redemption price and 33 some years later, he would go willingly to the cross in our place. He was taking that step. We see him in the garden saying, Father, if it would be possible, let this cup pass from me. Father, I, I don't know. Uh, I'm taking this step because you've told me to take this step. I don't want to take this step. Father, I'm asking that you would meet me because not my will be done, but your will be done. And he stepped forward. And he stepped all the way in to where he was condemned for crimes he did not commit. He was condemned not just by the, the heathens, the unrighteous, but he was condemned by what should have been the righteous of his own people. And he took those steps that led him all the way to Golgotha. Crown of thorns, having been beaten and scourged. And he took those steps that took him all the way to the cross. And on that cross, he said, Father, forgive them. Forgive them. I think in the immediacy, he's talking about those that have actually condemned him to die and put him on the cross. But I think in eternity, he's speaking about all of us. Father, this is the price that you've required to be paid. Father, I am paying the price. Forgive them. Forgive them. See, all of this, and, and then three days later, the earth shakes, the stone is rolled away. <clears throat> we were at a prayer meeting Wednesday night, and David shared a scripture, uh, a snippet that he had seen in scripture that just kind of jumped out and made alive. Because, see, when the angel rolled the stone away, the guards fell as though dead. 
<coughs> and then the women came, and the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. He didn't say that to the soldiers. They had every reason to be afraid. <coughs> but he told the women, Do not be afraid. And then Jesus walked out of that tomb. He took those steps in victory. Now see, we're standing at the cusp for everything we do is operating in faith. We are trusting that it is so because God has said it is so. But one of these days, those that veil that blinds our eyes that we see through dimly is going to be stripped away and we will see him face to face and we will know the fruition of everything that right now we are hoping for. All of this was wrapped up in that baby, that little child that was born that Christmas morning. Whatever the month, whatever the day, Christmas. Father, we bless you this morning and we, Father, our hearts cannot express enough our gratitude. Father, the depth of our gratitude. Father, that we owe you everything and more. That, Father, you loved us so much that you made a way, you sent your one and only Son to become our sacrifice, to stand in our place, to take our sin and our judgment that we might be righteous. Father, we thank you. And as we celebrate and we gather with family and friends, Father, to celebrate Christmas, I ask, Lord God, that you would birth anew the zeal for you, the passion for you, the hunger and the desire for you. And as we celebrate the birth of this Christ child, we would remember that, Father, the birth was intrinsic, was, was knitted together with the death and the resurrection. Father, that we would be honoring of you this Christmas. We bless you, we thank you, we honor you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.